I, I can't say that I'm surprised. Uh, I didn't expect it, you know. Uh, actually, we were supposed to be at our home church tonight in our missions conference. Uh, we've been in missions conference at University Baptist Church since Sunday. Uh, Brother Dwayne Moore's been there as our main preacher and had several different missionaries. It's been a great meeting, great meeting. But there's just so many things going on today. Uh, my wife had a doctor's appointment and uh, this afternoon and then I've got uh, I've got an appointment Friday uh, to go down to Johns Creek and have a colonoscopy so uh, tomorrow is preparation day <laughs> I hate it I told him I said hey I don't mind Friday I'll be asleep <laughs> but uh, anyway though appreciate your prayers uh, that uh, doctor needed to do this. He found out back, um, oh, it was around Mother's Day, I guess, when I hemorrhaged and stayed in the hospital about four days. I had had some things that popped in my in my colon and I, I bled, I lost six pounds of blood. <laughs> and uh, But uh, this is sort of a follow-up to take care of some other problems that the doctor found in the colon that, that uh, we need to we need to take, take care of. But anyway though, God is in control. Amen. And nothing happens with God, with God as far as accidental. Uh, I mean, God, you know, He knows what's going on. And uh, I, I, I learned a long time ago, and I'm thankful that I learned this. I learned a long time ago, it's just be best just to just rely on the Lord and, and let, let, him, let Him direct things, let Him take you. I've done a lot of unnecessary worrying. <laughs> yeah, I've, done, I've done a lot of un, unnecessary fretting, you know, about, well, what's going to happen with this and what's going to happen with that and, and how's this going come, come to come to be. And, uh, but God had it in control all the time. It's been, it's been utterly amazing uh, over the years to see God work as He has you know, in our life and in our ministry and some of the things that, that's, uh, that's been done. It's, it's just been absolutely amazing. Turn with me, if you will, in your Bible to Luke chapter 18. Turn over here to Luke chapter 18. Uh, now, to show you, uh, I, I'm, I don't have everything really put together. I have, I have the thought and I have uh, some notes here that uh, I believe the Lord might, might have me to use. But... Uh, uh, the Lord's going to have to put it together, uh, as He always has to. Uh, and uh, I appreciate the, uh, the confidence that Brother Mark has in us to give us the opportunity to stand here before you. I thoroughly enjoyed being with you during the missions conference. Oh, that was just such a blessing to Shirley and I. And I tell you what, uh, it, it's just a blessing when we can come and visit with you folks. Uh, we come in and just like tonight, we have some good singing and that refreshes us. Now I'll be honest with you, I, I've been tired this afternoon and, and running a little, little low on energy. But uh, coming in and have some good singing, you know, it just refreshes me. And I know that I'll always get that here. And, and so, and then of course I was, I was, thought I was looking forward to hearing Brother Mark preach tonight, but you know, the Lord knows, and so we'll just, we'll just let, let the Lord have His way. Look at Luke chapter 18, and I'm going to read uh, verses 1 through 5. And as you stand with me, I appreciate that. And He spake a parable, He, the Lord, spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. Now, just think, think on that. We ought to put Selah right there. Think on that. Uh, but then I want to go on with the parable in verse 2, saying, there was in a city a judge, which feared not God, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city. And she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. And he would not for a while. But afterward he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. Now, we see something here uh, in this parable that the Lord gives us about, about prayer. Of course, men ought always to pray and not to, to faint. Now, the word faint here uh, is more in the sense of not, not passing out, uh, but losing heart. Right. Losing heart. Getting discouraged and, 
and just getting to the place that you just think, what, what's the use? You ever get there? Uh, we all do. We all do. But not to faint, not to lose heart, because God is faithful and God is always true. Let's bow our heads for just a moment of prayer. Father, we thank you for your blessings. We thank you for this good church and this pastor that means so much to us. We thank you, dear Lord, for their faithful support of our ministry over these last several years. And uh, Lord, we just uh, pray that you'll continue to bless in this place, that you'll continue to meet needs, that you'll continue to raise up young men men, uh, Lord, out of this church. Uh, used to, we'd go to churches uh, just about everywhere, and there was young preachers, young preachers. But today, Lord, we don't see that, and just in certain places. But Lord, we thank you, Lord, for what you're doing here, and pray that you'll continue to bless, bless Brother Mark, and continue to use him. May Christ be honored, may he be glorified above everything else. In Jesus Christ's name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Now, over, I believe it's 2 Thessalonians 5, it says, pray without ceasing. Now, how, how do you do that? You can't be on your knees all the time. Uh, but let me tell you what, I, I get more praying done, praying, <laughs> more praying done, uh, really in my car riding down the road than I do probably any place else. Uh, and and, and it's, what it's talking about, pray without ceasing, we need to be in a continual state of mind of prayer. Uh, because it gives us opportunity to talk to the Lord about things and, and, uh, and, and, and find the Lord's direction, find, find His blessings. But now, I wanna, I wanna, this is what I want to preach about. I want to ask you this question, and then I'll give you th three answers. Why should we pray? A lot of folks think, well, you know, is there any, any real value in praying? Now, there's some people that they pray, and they pray, and they pray, and they pray, and, and God doesn't answer. And they, they, and they faint. They lose heart. They lose heart. And then they give up. But what I've always said is this. You know, they'll never know how close they might have been to where God was going to answer that prayer. And that God was going to do something great and mighty in, 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 uh, in their life. And they, and they give up. So we can't give up. So why, why should we pray? We need to, we need to pray because, uh, you know, God wants us to, to, to look to Him. He wants us. Praying shows our reliance on God. You know, uh, there's, there's a, a lot of things that I've wanted to do over the years, uh, but I didn't get to do it uh, because I'd had to done it in my strength, and I didn't have the strength to do it. But yet, on the same token, I've seen God answer prayers. Oh, my goodness. It's just, I, I think back over these 50-something years now of ministry, I think back to uh, so many, so many prayers that I know, I know for a fact that God has answered and done great, great, great things. They've been little things that God did that encouraged me and helped me. But you see, uh, I, had, I had a special blessing when I was a little boy. I had a I had an old-fashioned grandma, and my mom and dad were working on shift work a lot during that time, and, and we stayed at Grandma and Granddaddy's house. Me and my sister was just a baby then. We stayed at Grandma and Granddaddy's house an awful lot during the week, spend the night. We were there with them. Never, never did I spend a night in my granny's, uh, gran grandma's house uh, that she didn't pray before she went to bed. And we, time to go to bed. Uh, now my granddaddy, he was a good man, but he's a quiet man. You know, he wasn't really out, outgoing, outspoken. But when it came time to pray uh, at night, Grandma said, all right, time for us to pray. And she'd get me uh, over, she'd get down in her old cane bottom rocker that she had. And she'd pull me right up, just like a, just like a mama hen pull, pulls up its baby. You know, and then she'd pray. Granddaddy, he'd be knelt over here, but my grandma did all the praying. Now, you know, uh, that's, not, that's not to demean my granddaddy. Like I said, he was a good man. But my grandma, she was known as a woman of prayer. Amen. And I'll tell you, as a little boy, I remember that very well. And it marked me. Right. It marked me. This was, this was years before I was saved. It was years before I was saved. But that still, still lingers with me today, and I, I think of it. I think of it so often. I remember uh, just a, a short, very short time after I got saved. I was about 11 years old, and I got saved in this little country Methodist church. 
long time before the United Methodists. It's back when the Methodists had fire and, and that man, they preached. Oh, I'm telling you what. My grandma was an old fashioned shouting Methodist. I mean, that's, that's just it. But, you know, uh, we, came, we went to uh, the church that I belonged to, where my grandma belonged, where I joined after I got saved. And, and I asked him to baptize me, by the way. I don't know why. But I asked the preacher, I said, would you take me down to the creek and baptize? I was just a boy. But that's what I wanted. Right. Yeah, they would have sprinkled me if I, and you know, that, that's the way they did some things, I guess. But, and I don't know, you know, don't understand about that. But anyway, though, uh, uh, you know, join the church. I got saved, join the church. Was well, the, the preacher, he pastored two churches. He had a sort of a circuit. Well, actually three. There was uh, one church that he was there every other week. And there was uh, another church. He was there every other week. And then there was a third church, little church, way out in the country that they only met on the fifth Sunday. And that's the only Sunday. They, they had Sunday school every, every, every Sunday. Uh, but I walked, we went to the church at Waco, which is not the one that I joined, but I evidently must not have been having church at, uh, at Bethlehem, where I joined my grandma. But we walked in, and here I am, just a boy. Just a boy. I've never led a prayer. I've never led a prayer. And I walked in the door and Preacher Perry, he said, uh, we're glad to, to see Carl Braswell here tonight and, and his mom and dad and, and so glad to have him. And Carl, I want you to come on up here to the pulpit and lead us in prayer. <laughs> now some of you guys, you pray and that's good. Uh, but uh, you, don't get, you didn't get called on when you'd never prayed before, <laughs> publicly. And so, you know, I marched straight up to the pulpit just like I'm standing there and prayed. You know what I did though? I prayed my grandma's prayer. She taught me how to pray. Now, her praying wasn't just helping me with God's blessings, but her prayer was teaching me too. Amen. And I'll never, I'll never forget that. Let me tell you one other thing real quick. And then I'll, there's just three things that I want to talk about tonight, so I'll not, I'll not be lengthy. But I remember very well as a boy, just maybe a year or so older uh, than after I got, I was about 12, something like that, I guess, uh, after I got saved uh, when I was uh, 11. But uh, uh, I wanted a bicycle. <clears throat> I wanted a bicycle. Now, we lived out in the country. Now, we didn't hurt. We had everything that we needed, but we were not wealthy by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, but... Uh, I, I wanted a bicycle, and, and I'd said something to Mom about, you know, Mom, I sure would like to have a bicycle. She said, well, son, you know that we just can't afford a bicycle right now. And I said, well, okay. But I prayed. Now, I want to tell you how I, pray. I prayed. I said, Lord, and I learned this from my grandma, too. Lord, I want a bicycle. And if you give me a bicycle, Lord, I promise you I will use it to, get, to bring you honor and glory. Now, how's a 12-year-old boy going to take a bicycle and use it to bring honor and glory to the Lord? But I'd heard Grandma say that if, if the Lord would answer, she would take the answer and use it to give God the glory and give Him all the honor. But anyway, a few days passed, and my mom came in one afternoon, and she said, Carl, said, um, there's a paper route that's just opened up here. I lived in a little town of Waco, out between Bremen and Tallapoosa, out in West Georgia. And out in the country, actually. And uh, she said, there's a paper route just opened up here in Waco. And, and uh, uh, you, you can do that without any problem. Uh, and if you want to go with me to the Western Auto tomorrow, we'll go get you a bicycle. And you can take that paper route. And you'll be able to buy your bicycle and you'll be able to pay for it. <laughs> How about that? Uh, how about that? Well, the Lord gave me answer. I know for sure that's the first prayer for sure that God answered for me. But that's not the end of the story. I started riding that bicycle. Mother and dad wasn't real faithful, wasn't real regular in church at that time. They got more so later, but at that time, they, they were not real regular. Uh, so I'd get up on Sunday morning. Now the little church that my grandma belonged to was out in the country, and it was a good uh, eight, nine miles from our house, from where we lived. I'd get up on Sunday morning, I'd put my clothes on, I'd get on my bicycle, and I'd ride that bicycle all the way to Bethlehem Methodist Church over on the other side of Bremen. And one Sunday morning, I would got there just before Sunday school was to start, and there were some guys out there by the steps, uh, you know, talking, and, and uh, I pulled in and, and parked my bicycle, kicked the kickstand down, and parked it there and started up the steps. 
And I heard one of those guys say something. This is what he said. You know, I had forgot that I told the Lord I'd use that bicycle to honor and glorify him. <laughs> Did we not forget like that sometimes, folks? But anyway, I started up the steps into the church, and I heard this fellow tell this other man, he said, he said, that boy rode that bicycle all the way from his house to this church. If he can do that, we don't have any excuse not to be in church on Sunday. Amen. I use that bicycle to honor and glorify God. Amen. Amen. <laughs> oh man, it pays to pray. Right. It pays to pray. But why should why why should should we we pray? Now the teaching in in this this passage that I read to you in, in Luke, uh, it, it, prayer should be uh, continuous and also over in Second Thessalonians, <laughs> prayer should be con consistent and continuous. That's, that prayer should be consistent and continuous. Not just pray for a while when it's convenient, you know, and, or when we need something or we want something. But it needs to be consistent and it needs to be continuous. Now, we miss a lot. We, I say me, I include me. I miss a lot, I'm sure, because I'm not always as faithful in, in praying and being, and, and, and being continuous and being consistent. But if we'll be consistent and we'll be continuous, uh, we, you can be assured that God is going to respond to your prayers. You, you can know that and not miss some blessing. And here's the thing, too. You know, everybody can pray. Right. Everybody can pray. Amen. A lot of folks that can't get out and visit and can't do a lot of other things, there's blind folks, there's deaf folks, you know, there's other folks that have physical uh, problems that, you know, that they can't, uh, can't get out and go for the Lord like, like I'm sure they'd love to. But let me tell you what, everybody can pray. Everybody can pray. And I'm sure that my grandma's prayers had a lot to, to me being the man that I am today. And I'm sure that there's a lot of folks that, uh, that I've prayed for over, over the years uh, and had a burden for and prayed for that they, they may be saved today because me and some other folks, we, we were determined we were going to pray. We were going to pray for this person until that need was met. So we need to be in our prayer life. We need to be consistent and we need to be continuous. Pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. Now, why? Here's, here's three things why we ought to pray. Number one, if we'll pray, prayer opens doors. Right. Prayer will open doors for you that otherwise you will never have the opportunity to go through. Right. Now, I can, speak, I can speak from personal experience on this. And the Bible is full of illustrations. One example is, is Nehemiah. And Nehemiah is one of my favorite books in, in, in the Bible. This man, Nehemiah, he had been carried away captive, and there he was in the king's palace. He was a slave. He couldn't do what he wanted to do, but his heart was still back at Jerusalem. Every time people would come in, a caravan would come through. Every time people would come in, uh, uh, Nehemiah, he'd, he'd look them up. He'd say, hey, look, did you, did you come through Jerusalem? Uh, how are the people there? What's going on there? How's the city? And there's always bad report. Always a bad report. But he was continually asking folks because his heart was there uh, in his homeland and he wanted to be there. And so he began to pray. I mean, what can a slave do? I mean, he was the king's cup, cup bearer. What, what can a slave do? He was obligated to the king. He couldn't say, hey, hey, Mr. King, I'm going to take a couple of weeks vacation and go over to Jerusalem and visit some of my folks over there. No, he couldn't do that. He could not do anything. But he began to pray. He began to pray. He didn't try to pull strings. He didn't try to go to the uh, king and, sh and sugar sugarcoat him, you know. He began to pray. And you, you look in the first chapter of Nehemiah, you see his prayer that he prayed. And then one day, one day, he, he's, a, he's a little, uh, I, won't, I won't say moody, but he was a little maybe discouraged, had that look about him. And he was a faithful servant. He was a faithful man, loved God. But the king noticed, said, Nehemiah, what's the matter with you? And it opened the door up for Nehemiah to talk to him. He said, look, how can I be happy? How can I be satisfied when, when the, 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 the city lies, uh, Jerusalem lies desolate, the walls are torn down, and my people are living in a reproach? How can I be happy? 
God moved. See, Nehemiah's prayers moved God, and then God moved on the heart of a heathen king. Amen. Let me tell you what, God works in the heart of, of people that are not saved. God moves in the heart and lives of people not saved. They don't even know. I mean, Cyrus, Cyrus was not, was not a saved man. But yet, though God moved on his heart and, and he, he gave permission for, for, the, uh, for the children of Israel to do things that they otherwise couldn't have done. But let me tell you what, prayer opens doors. When we pray, if we've got specific needs, God opens doors. I remember we started Harvest Baptist Church, number one. <laughs> this is Harvest Baptist Church, number two. I hope that don't offend you. I don't mean for it to. But I started Harvest Baptist, number one, uh, down in Ackworth. And uh, I had become acquainted with the vice president of First National Bank in Marietta, Mr. Hester, good man, Christian man. And that's where I did my business. That's where the church, uh, uh, you know, after we started, well, I'd been at Mount Arbor, and that's where we'd done our business when I was at Mount Arbor, too, uh, before we went up and started Harvest. But anyway, though, uh, we, were, we were meeting in a school building, and we were getting to the place that we was ready to start. We'd bought some property. We was ready to build our first building. Well, Mr. Hester had told me, Several times when I'd be in to see him, he said, how are you coming along? And I said, well, we, we're moving good. Things are going well. He said, when you get ready to build your building, you come see me. You won't have any problem about your financing on your building. And so I said, well, thank you, Mr. Hester. I appreciate that. Well, one Saturday morning, uh, we was getting ready. to. Uh, had, we had our plans. In fact, I had, I had the, that Friday, I had carried the plans by the bank uh, to talk to Mr. Hester, and he was in the hospital sick. And his secretary said, well, look, he's supposed to get out probably even today or tomorrow. Just leave the plans here. I'll give them to him. And next week when he gets back, he'll look at him and he'll be in touch with you. I said, great. Saturday morning, one of the men in the church that had a job, he had to go to work real early on Saturday. And my phone rang and Brother Kitchen said, preacher, you heard the news? And I said, no, what, what are you talking about? I heard the news. He said, Dave Hester died this morning. The man that we was counting on died. Yeah. And uh, I was devastated. I went, I went in on Monday and asked his secretary, she said, well, you'll have to talk to Mr. So-and-so. And I went to Mr. So-and-so. Mr. So-and-so looked at me, you know, like I was crazy, man. What do you mean? We don't make loans like that. People that we don't even know. But I knew the vice president. But the vice president died. And they wouldn't even talk to us. I went to the church that Wednesday night. And I told the church what had happened. And uh, I, I said, folks, we, we got to pray. We got to pray. And we gathered in the altar. Is old Blackwell School on, on uh, Bells Ferry Road coming out of Marietta. That building's torn down and gone. Now, you very well remember that over there, Rich. But uh, in the, in the, in the, they had a cafetorium like. And that's where we got permission to meet. And we met there for a, for a few months, about four or five months. But that, that night, that, that Wednesday night, I called the people to prayer and we gathered in the altar. There's about 25, 30 of us. We gathered in the altar and we began to pray and ask God to move. Well, the next day or so, there was a lawyer that ha had helped us get our incorporation papers and everything together to organize the church. And, and I went to see him and uh, to tell him what's happening. And he said, you know, Carl said there's a new bank it's opened up here in Marietta. They got a new office on the other side of the square. You ought to go by and see them. You never know what might happen. Well, I go over there and I walk in. I'm Carl Braswell with Harvest Baptist Church. We, we're a new church. We got, you know, a handful of people. We don't have any money, but we, we need the money to build us a new building. And, and with that kind of idea, you know. <laughs> but I, walk, I walked in and I told the lady at the, at the desk, I needed to talk to the manager uh, that uh, I wanted to talk to, to him about the possibility of us getting a loan to build our, our church. She said, well, the manager, he's, he's gone two weeks. He's in the reserve, and he's gone for two weeks summer, summer camp. But said, there's a, there's a guy that's sitting, sitting in for him while he's gone. Let me let you talk to him. And here was a young fellow just wanting to do something, wanting to do something big and say, hey, I did that. I made, this, I made this loan. 
And uh, he took all the information. I showed him the plans and everything. He called me back. And folks, in a week's time, we had a loan. Amen. Because God's people prayed. Right. Amen. God's people prayed. God, when, 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 God, when we pray, prayer opens doors. And, and the, the, the lesson here in this is that it's opportunity. When we pray, God gives us opportunity. You say, well, I, well, I'd really like to serve the Lord. I'd like to do this or that or the other. You know, uh, I, I'd like maybe some of these days go on some of these mission trips. Or uh, maybe God's, you know, kind of tickling your heart a little bit about, hey, maybe God wants you to do something. And you say, I can't, you know, I can't do that. But let me tell you what. God, give, I, when we pray, God uh, gives us opportunity. Opportunity. And continual and consistent prayer uh, when it's put in action, it causes, it causes doors to open. And you can count on it. You can count on it. I um, have had some situations uh, back when I was by vocational. I, start, I had the privilege of having start Grace Baptist Church over in Mapleton. That's my first church. And, uh, you know, I saw God do, do, do some things there when, when we prayed. And God just opened doors. And that's a going church today. They relocated there out at Powder Springs now. But, uh, you know, God, you know, when we pray, God moves and God gives opportunities. And, Amen. hey, you say nothing's happening in my life. Nothing's happening, you know, in my, in my spiritual life. Maybe you're not praying right. Maybe you're not taking it to the Lord like you should. But, you know, it don't always happen just like it did with a, with a loan at, at harvest, you know, when we, we got that first loan there. But it, it, it's, it's th things happen. Last time, I, last time I was up here, I mentioned uh, to Brother Mark that uh, we've been given, Latin America Outreach has been given 3,000 uh, uh, hardback Bibles Beams down in Gulfport, Mississippi. Uh, they had them printed and, and they've given us 3,000 Bibles. They've given us 2,000 uh, other books that are commentary type books. So we've got 5,000 books. And all we got to do is ship them uh, to, to Central America. That's all we got to do, ship them to Central America. We've been given 3,000 Bibles. That's... that's that's, oh, that's a ton and a half, just about. How much is a ton? 2,000 pounds? Uh, that, that's, that's a ton and a half, just about. But it was going to cost $2,500 to ship them. <laughs> I didn't have $2,500. I checked with Shirley. She didn't have $2,500 either. Uh, Brother Mendoza, he's the guy that put it on me. He called me up and said, Brother Carl says, we've get, been given these Bibles. We've got to get them. We need them down there right now. Uh, but we've got to have $2,500. We've got to transport them from Gulfport uh, by truck all the way to Miami. And then from Miami, we'll load, load them up in a container and we'll, sh we'll ship them to, to Nicaragua. But we need $2,500. Now, I'll be honest with you, Brother Mark, when I was mentioning that to you the other day, I was kind of dragging about that. I'm thinking, Lord, how, where are we going to get $2,500? You know what? Other night, some friends. Now, here's the way I pray when there's needs like this. I pray, Lord, you know that we have this need. Would you lay it on somebody's heart that has the means? Because a lot of you folks just like me, you don't have $2,500 either. <laughs> But I pray, Lord, lay it on the heart of somebody that has the means to help us. And you'll be absolutely amazed sometimes where it'll come from. God will send it, but he'll use a, he'll use a vessel. Right. But we were going to go out and eat with this couple that we're friends. And uh, they had read my prayer letter. The last people in the world that I thought might give us some money on, on that on that shipping cost was those folks, really. I, I had no idea. But we'd gone by their house and, and met them. Then we were going to go out and eat uh, and just a couple of weeks ago now. And um, the lady said uh, to her husband, said, should we tell Brother Carl and, uh, about what we, what we need to let him know about? And, and I'm thinking, what are they going to tell me? What are they going to tell me about? Anyway, though, they had gone to take care of some business that day at the bank. And these folks have some means. 
You would not know that probably, but I mean, they don't boast it or anything like that. But anyway, they said, uh, the lady did, Brother Carl, we talked about it. And uh, I asked my husband how much he thought, and she, she said, we, we had not talked about it, but we was at the bank and I told my husband that that was bothering me and I felt like that, that we needed to do something. And he said, well, you know what? He said, I've been feeling the same way. And they said, she said, well, you know, I was thinking about giving, giving $2,000. Woo! And uh, he said, well, I, I was thinking about giving 1000 <laughs> So we ended up getting 3000 Amen. Hey, God opens doors right, and gives right. opportunity when we're, when we're faithful in our prayer life. Second thing, though. I want you to see uh, from the scriptures as well. Not only does prayer open doors, but prayer changes things. Right. Prayer changes things. We just, you know, you got any rivers you need to cross, any mountains you need to climb? You need to pray. You need to pray. Prayer changes things. We've got a good example. We've got a good example in the scriptures from, of Hezekiah in 2 Kings chapter 20. You know, uh, here he is, he's died. And uh, Isaiah goes in and gives the message. Set your house in order because you're going to die. But Hezekiah began to pray. And he turned his face to the wall and began to weep and cry. And, and reminded the Lord of his faithfulness. And before, Hez before, Nehemiah, uh, before uh, Isaiah got out of the courtyard, the Bible says, God spoke to him and said, go back and tell him I'm going to give him 15 more years. See, this man cried to God. Cried out to God. And God responded. And, and God, uh, uh, he changed the situation. And gave him 15 more years. Another, another example, of course, is, is Elijah. Here's Elijah, you know, stand up uh, before Ahab and all the crowd there on the mountain. And, uh, you know, uh, he does an impossible thing. Elijah, he says, uh, he said, now, you prophets of Baal, he said, build your altar and put your offering on it and fix it and everything, and you pray. And he said, I'll build, an altar, I'll build the Lord's altar, and I'll put the sacrifice on it, and I'll pray. And he said, let, let's let the one, the, the one that answers with fire be God. Amen. Well, you know, the prophets of Baal, they thought that's a good deal. The thing about most deceived people is for, in religion today is concerned they really believe what they're, what they're deceived. Anyway, they went, hopped around there and jumped on their uh, offering and they cried out to Baal, cried out to Baal. Elijah made fun of them. He just sit over and cross over and watched for a while. Uh, he knew his time to pray had come. But they prayed and they prayed and they prayed and they prayed. No fire. No fire. So Elijah, about time for the evening offering, he says, it's my time. I'm sort of paraphrasing here a little bit. <laughs> my time. And he said, everything in order with the altar. And the offering, the wood. And then he says, strange thing, dig a trench around that uh, altar and fill it up with water. Hey, they were in the middle of the worst drought. Hadn't rained in three and a half years. Fill it up. I don't know where they got water. They filled it up. He said, do it again. Do it again. Water was just a running. And Elijah prayed, oh, I believe it's about 40 words. That's all he prayed. He didn't have to pray all, all afternoon. He didn't have to run around and holler and, and cut himself like those, those uh, prophets of Baal were doing. Uh, he, he acknowledged God and he prayed to the God of heaven and fire fell from heaven. And what happened? <laughs> you talk about prayer changing things. You know, uh, he, he'd said to the people of Israel, look, let's put this to a test. And they, had, they didn't say a word. They just stood there and looked at him. But when fire fell, they begin to cry out, the Lord, He is God, the God. Amen. The Lord, He is the God. Amen. The God is a definite article there that means He's the one and only God. Amen. Amen. And the fire fell. The fire fell. And that, prophet, that crowd of uh, the prophets of Baal all, all got got. His old country boys say they, they got killed it. <laughs> they they got their reward. But you know what? Ahab, he's standing there watching that, and he is not moved in the least. See, some people 
All the prayer in the world is not going to change them. Because they, 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 they've become, they've become, uh, what's the word I'm trying to find? Their heart is so hardened that they're not going to respond to God under any circumstance. What's the word I'm looking for? Ah, that's all right. Anyway, he, 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 went, he went to eat after this happened. And, but see, the work wasn't done. Elijah went up on the mountain. He had some more praying to do because it still hadn't rained. Right. He gets up there and, and he bows down and gets down on his, I mean, his face, literally. And he prays and he asks his servant to go up and see what you see. And he goes up and says, I don't see anything. He comes back and don't see anything. Elijah prays again and prays again. And I, I don't know how many times he prayed there, but they, see, here, here's where you come in. It's got, it's got to be continuous. It's got to be consistent. God didn't answer the first time he prayed, so Elijah prayed again. Didn't answer that time, Elijah prayed again. But then finally, finally though, the, his, his servant comes back and said, I see a little cloud coming up out of the sea like the hand of a man. Elijah said, time to go. <laughs> time to go. I got to get down and tell Ahab it's fixing to rain. <laughs> God answered in prayer, and rain fell. Rain fell. Oh, let me tell you what. You know, our, our lesson here in that God changes things is simply God's in control, folks. Right. Amen. God's in control. Count on it. God's in control. Now, if God's not answering some prayer that you feel is so necessary, so essential, there's a reason for it. You know, sometimes we pray for things that, uh, you, know, we're not, you know, we're not ready to handle or we're not prepared for or maybe God knows he can't trust us with it. And we, we pray for the wrong thing. And God says, no, I'm just not going to, I'm not going to answer that. But, you know, God lets us know that He is in control. Amen. You know, circumstances, we, fa we face things a lot of times in our lives that's it's just out of our hands. Right. It's just out of our hands. I remember, and I may have told about this before, when we, when we were able to buy the four-color press at at Macedonia, $139,000. And listen, that to me was an absolute impossibility. But I believe God could. My faith was a little wavery, but I believe God could. And sure enough, the pastor calls me one day and he said, Brother Braswell said, that bothered me since I heard you talk about that in the meeting <coughs> down in Florida. He said, that's been bothering me. And been getting into bed with me and he said I want you to tell me more about it how, how, it, will, how it will benefit you and what you can do with it and, and I, I explained to him we could print full color and you know it, it would revolutionize our printing ministry completely and he, he, he liked what I told him he said well I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to meet with my men and we're going to pray about it he said I believe we'll probably be able to help you and I'm thinking Ooh, if he could give us $500 wouldn't that be wonderful if he gave us $1,000, wow, that would really be great. He called me back the next week and he said, we, well, the men met and we prayed, presented to the church, and the church voted to send you $25,000. Amen. Not a great big church either. They run about 100, 200, something like that, 150, 200 maybe. But see, God's in control, folks. Amen. Uh, let's not faint. Let's not lose heart. Because the circumstances around us are, are just choking, seemingly choking us to death. Lift up our, we need to lift up our heads and right. lift up our eyes to the Lord of heaven and say, God, you know, I want your will to be done in this matter. And you know the need. And if it's, if it's what will be good for us and for the glory of God, he'll bring it to pass. You can count on that. Let me mention one other thing. Prayer brings blessings. Amen. Prayer brings blessings. These are just simple thoughts, folks. But this is what prayer will do. Our example is Jeremiah 33, 3. Call unto me, saith the Lord, and I will show thee great and mighty things that thou knowest not. Now, I probably didn't quote that verbatim, but that's a great verse. Amen. Call unto me. Jeremiah, call unto the Lord. And God, you know, God responded and blessed his man and blessed his people. You know, uh, God supplies 
all our needs. And I believe, I believe he supplies our wants sometimes. We, we need to honor him. I believe God gives us even our wants. Uh, but, you know, uh, as I, I, I mentioned when I started out about how that God answered some prayers about, my, about the bicycle and, and, and then, of course, about the, about the, the printing press. But um, I want to ask you a question. Uh, do you remember prayers that God has specifically answered in your life? It might not be a great big thing. But it might be like the bicycle. To me, that was a great big thing. But do you, can you remember in your life that God has answered specific prayers? I mean, you've been between, maybe as the old saying goes, between the rock and the hard place. And you didn't know what you was going to do. You didn't know which way you was going to turn. But God stepped in in response to your prayers. And God answered your prayer. And God blessed. Oh, I was thinking. I was just, not just fairly recent. I was just going back in my mind thinking about how wonderful God had been to bless me and Shirley. All these years. We've been married 58 years now. All these years. We have never lacked. We have never lacked. Now, boy, as a young man, I was very foolish and I had to learn some things the hard way. I thought, you know, that uh, you, know, you didn't have to pray as much as you did know the banker. And I thought, uh, when, when, when I was a young man, I thought, uh, and I, I saved and I loved the Lord and I was serving the Lord. But I had the idea that I had to have a new car for two years. And so what I do? I'd take what I owed on the last one and put it forward and buy me a new one. And I, I, <laughs> I, I shackled myself. It put me in a place that I couldn't do a lot of the things that I, I couldn't give, you know, as much for missions. And I couldn't do as much, you know, because I was, but then, you know, I prayed about that. And God worked in it. <laughs> it caused Shirley to have, to have a wreck. <laughs> a drunk hit her, pulled out and hit her one day and. And the settlement that came out of that paid us out of debt. You say, you're praying for your wife to have, no, no, I wasn't praying for my wife to be hurt, man. But see, God uses a lot of different things. And stuff, but I see God's hand in it. Right. That God has His purpose. And today, you know, God's blessed us. Now, I'm by no means wealthy. In fact, I was meeting with a financial advisor the other day at the bank, and we can't figure out how I'm going to have enough money if, when I have to retire. He said, how much you have to have to live on? I gave him a figure, and he started doing this, doing this. He said, well, i got to work on this, and I'll get back with you. <laughs> well, I, I appreciate that guy's help, but I'm not depending on him. Right, amen. I depend on the Lord. We've never lacked, and I don't. I know, I know our God is going to take care of us. He's going to, he, He's blessed us and blessed us and blessed us this time after time after time with material things. Material things. When I went with Macedonia, I'd been living in a parsonage for the most part of my ministry. I never had my own house, but just in a couple of situations. Well, then, though, I, the Lord leads me to go with Macedonia, and, and I resign at Harvest, number one, and, and uh, I go with Macedonia, and I don't have a place to live. We lived in an apartment. We lived with our daughter for a year and her husband. Boy, they were gracious. And then we lived in an apartment for a while. But God worked a miracle. There, a house came available. That where we live now, I've been there for about... 17, 18 years, I guess now. And the guy, he'd been a member of our church at Fellowship, but he got a new job up in Nashville and he was going to have to move. And he, he told me, he told me uh, well, I heard him tell, telling the pastor one day that he thought he might just rent the house for a while because the economy was sort of down then. It's been 17, 18 years ago. 
So I called him up and I said, we might be interested. I'd like to get out of that apartment I'm living in. And uh, so I went out to see the house and, and uh, he said, I'd like to sell you the house. I said, listen, I've been with Macedonia less than a year now. And can you imagine me going into a loan officer and saying, I want to finance this house. And well, wh 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 where do you work? Well, uh, I'm a missionary. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, wh what, what, what kind of salary you got? Don't have a salary. Uh, <laughs> that don't get you many loans. But a year later, we rented the house for a year. A year later, uh, the boy called me and he said, Bill Carl, he said, I, I wish you could buy the house. I'd like to just get it out of my hands and I don't have to worry about it. I said, well, I'll make an application. But I said, Danny, I don't think there's any way. But we prayed about it. Sure, and I did. And we went to see a lady that had worked with some of the Macedonian missionaries and helping them. You should help Brother Hamby and some of the other guys, you know, get loans to buy houses. And she told me what to bring. So I got it all together and carried it over. And I really didn't think that there'd be a chance, a, you know. But she called me in a few days and said, your loan's been approved. Amen. Your loan's been approved. And we moved in our house with a $33,000 equity. <laughs> That's how God works, folks. Listen, prayer brings blessings. Prayer brings blessings. And it pays to pray. I'm not talking about, you know, getting down on your knees. Now, if you pray that way, that's fine. And I'm sure God answers some prayers. But you don't have to pray yourself to where you can't set up. If you just get, if you just get down and talk to God, come before God humbly, acknowledging who you are and what, what you are, and who I am, I have to, who I am and what I am, uh, and, and, and take it to the Lord. God answers prayer. You can. You might be facing a real difficult decision right now. God answers prayer. I mean, you may be dealing with a real, real difficult financial problem. God answers prayer. Right. You, you may have a problem in the home. You know, we all have all kinds of problems. But I want you to know, God answers prayer. I'll give you one other example. It was a few years after we'd started Harvest, and this couple came and joined the church. And their friends came, started coming, but they never joined the church. And after a while, uh, there was a problem that arose in their, in their relationship. And the wife ended up leaving the husband, and they ended up divorced. Well, this couple that had joined our church were faithful, faithful people, and they were praying. I prayed, but I'll be honest with you, after a year or so, I, it didn't come to my mind that much. I didn't know where Steve and Gwen were, and I, I didn't know what happened to them. Uh, but Don, Al and Donna were still, I knew they were still praying. They'd mention them from time to time. One day I'm in my office there at Harvest on a Saturday morning, and I've been studying and preparing some, and my phone, the phone rings, and I pick it up, and it's, it's this guy, Steve. And he tells me, this is Steve, and... I said, hey, Steve, how you doing? That was the last fellow in the world I expected to get a phone call from. And he said this. He said, Gwen and I have been getting together. And I said, oh, something's going on here. God was answering prayer. He said, what I wanted to do, I just wanted to ask you if it'd be all right for me and Gwen to come by and talk to you. He said, we've gotten remarried, uh, and I just, we want to talk to you and see if it'd be all right with you for us to join the church. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they're still married, tighter than ever today, and since then had a bunch more kids. But God answered prayer, folks. Don't make any difference what area of life it might be in. God answers prayer. Right. Father, thank you, Lord, for this.